here in the hip. Okay. Here in the hills, in the Nilgiris, Christmas comes very early. Uh, we've already heard the Christmas story told and retold in different places here. Pandemic or not, Christmas never loses its magic. Okay, let me begin with a question. I'm asking everyone. What is the most beautiful thought that comes to you when you think of Christmas? What is the most beautiful thought that comes to you when you think of Christmas? Please unmute and share. For, for me, once I was in darkness, now in God's bright uh, glory, uh, we are living in a, in a light. For me, that's what I feel. Thank you, Lily. The light that shines in the darkness. And others? Fun and family and fellowship. <laughs> family and fellowship, okay. Others? I think it's for me, it's love. Love came down and, and giving because God gave to us eternal okay. life and we should also give to others. Okay. You almost preached my sermon, Claudette. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Tom. <laughs> no, no. It's wonderful. Any other thoughts? What's the most beautiful thought that comes to you when you think of Christmas? The joy. The joy. The, the joy. Okay. The joy. Any other thoughts? The needy. The what? Sorry. The needy. The needy. Okay. 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 Right. Christmas can be quite emotive for all of us. You know, the carols, the lighting of candles, singing of, uh, you know, silent night and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but you can ask the question, should it all make a difference to us? Can we truly celebrate Christmas as it should be? celebrated. Um, you know, the New Testament times resemble our times more than it does to the pre-pandemic times. And why do I say this? I would like us to refer to the New Testament hymn that was read to us, one of the hymns of the early church. Um, today, in the underground church in uh, China, I'm told that they meet in homes and not in churches. When preachers from outside manage to visit, it seems they are taken, let's say, at 7 a.m. to a house where the believers are gathered together, 7 to 8 p.m. And then they are, sorry, 7 to 8 p.m., that's right, they're taken at night. Then they are taken to another home, to another gathering. And it seems this goes on till 2 a.m. or so in the morning. Different homes, different groups. They don't stop. Just like the early church, they were persecuted. They could not draw attention to themselves. So there was hardly any singing. They used to meet in the catacombs or the graveyards, it seems. The section that we are going to look at was probably not a carol. It was only after Emperor Constantine declared Christianity the state religion could the church officially celebrate. So the songs of the New Testament were the way they taught. Remember, there was no New Testament in those early days. That's they used the songs to teach each other uh, Christian doctrine. There are places in the world today, I don't know if you have heard of this, 
where after the sermon is preached, it is translated into songs in the local idiom so that people can understand it better. Amazing. You know, it reminds you of the Wesley brothers in those glorious days of Methodism. You know, consider a song like, And Can It Be? You know, Charles Wesley wrote it after his brother preached the sermon. I mean, consider the themes of that song. You could do a very strong theological study of those lines and verses. Anyway, let's look at our passage. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 11. It was read to us a little earlier. Uh, just before we look at a few verses there, I asked the question, what happened when Jesus was born? I mean, we know the earthly story. You know, Mary and the shepherds and the angels and the wise men. But what actually happened? What we believe about God becomes our lifestyle. Very important. Christmas, we are told, should be a time not to just to celebrate, but to be replicated in our attitudes, in our Christian lifestyles. For me, four things stand out. Four things stand out. And I just quickly want to share them and finish. Can anyone read verse 6? Anyone? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Can anyone read it out loud? Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God some, something to be grasped? That's it. Verse 6. Yeah. Okay. Fine. Um, now, a lot of things give us significance. I want you to think for a moment. What gives you significance? I mean, could Jesus have done it any other way? Could salvation have been won for man any other way? I know I'm repeating a story that Everyone has probably heard, but it bears repeating. It's not a story, it's just an illustration. Imagine a colony of ants. Ants. They're all rushing across, and you can see that where they are going, you can see where they are going. And where they're going, right in their path, is a big hole. And you know that at the speed they're going, they're all going to fall into that hole and perish in the water at the bottom. So how do you warn them? You wish you could talk to the ants. You wish you could send them strong signals, but, but nothing, nothing works. They're going headlong to their doom. And there is only, only one way to do it. And what's that? You have to be able to talk to the ants. And the only way you can talk to the ants is to become an ant. Now, that is a very difficult proposition. What will happen if you become an ant? Any guesses? You lose your identity as a human being to become uh -huh. an ant. You will lose your identity as a human being. And not only that, even worse. You may, you may be destroyed. You could be trampled to death or be swallowed by a lizard. You, may, you will lose your humanness. And are there things so significant for our identity that we want to cling on to? We don't want to give them up, do we? Family name, position, status, a prosperous job, a bright future. 
you know, all these things, they are what gives us significance normally. But what did Paul say about all of them? I count it all rubbish, garbage, for something much higher, the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. I mean, imagine the scene in heaven when the second person of the Trinity said that he was going to give up his equality with God. The angels must have wondered what will happen if he goes to earth as a helpless baby? Here's a question. Have you been in a situation when you were totally powerless? Have you been in a situation when you were totally helpless? I think it was Bishop John Reed from Australia who first told the story of the two Australian um, seamen who had one drink too many and went ashore and walked the streets of London. You've probably heard of it. It was a foggy evening and they heard a man approach them. And unbeknown to them, the one approaching was a highly decorated naval officer, an admiral. They accosted him and asked him for directions. The officer replied, do you know who I am? At which one seaman turned to the other and said, now we are really in trouble. We don't know where we are and he doesn't know who he is. Totally powerless, powerlessness. Have you felt it? Have you known it? Have you faced a desperate situation like that in your life? I'm just wondering, in this group of some 40 people here today, would anyone like to share a situation in which you were totally, totally powerless? Anyone? Can you think of a situation in your life when you were totally helpless, powerless? Very briefly, anyone? Uncle Tom, I would like to. Please. So uh, I work a bit in the medical technology side, but when I had COVID, I knew that uh, there is help available, uh, but I couldn't do anything about it. Uh, so that was one point when I knew that I was not hopeless, but I knew that it is beyond my hands. Uh, whatever I knew, whatever knowledge was there, that's good, but I couldn't do anything about it. Thank you. Aha. Uh -huh. You knew and yet you were helpless. Okay, yeah. okay. Right. Um, I think of a young couple. Um, they told me their story some time ago. And the husband mm. he, uh, he described how he felt when their little four month old boy went into ICU with major, major complications. Tubes all over him, medicine, scans, doctors unsure of what the problem was, second opinions, et cetera, et cetera. Dad, he, he said, he just went out of the hospital. He sat on some steps and he just cried. He just cried and cried and cried. He just did not know what to do. Powerless. Have you or I ever chosen to become powerless? 
You know, in every situation that you and I face, we try to use our power, our influence, our friends, who we know, et cetera, et cetera. But have you ever, ever in your life or my life chosen to lay aside all this? Because that's what happened at Christmas. You know, we, we love to be in control. Some of us are control freaks. But God chose to become powerless. And what was the result? What was the result? You and I know. That's why we're here every Sunday at 3 o'clock. Thousands and millions found life. By our choice not to become powerless, we may have deprived us of life. It is quite possible that by clinging on to our power, we are depriving others of life. And in that choice of grasping it, you and I may have lost an opportunity to bring life to others. This Christmas, can we move from security to insecurity? If we choose to do it, we make life different for others. Okay, that's the first point, powerlessness. The second one, let's read the next one very quickly, verse 7. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. But made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant and coming in the likeness of men. Thank you. But made himself Simply one word, nothing. Not only the power that he has, and his power is all powerful, remember. But not only did he do that, he made himself nothing. He who was everything, remember he, he made the whole world. He who was everything made himself nothing. <laughs> Have you ever been in a situation where people do not know you? Have you ever been in a situation where you thought, you know, when you thought you were someone and then you went to a place and no one, not even one person knew who you were, what positions you held, what you did, what you were famous for, no one knew you. Have you ever been in a situation like that? especially for some of us older people after retirement, your pen, your signature is now worthless, no longer powerful, you feel insignificant. The world outside thinks you are someone, but then you go home and your parents treat you like a child, even though you're an adult. Or you move to a new place, new job, no one knows you. have the same attitude, the Bible says. What is the implication to make ourselves nothing? In our Christian circles, people want to be treated as important folk. How often do you hear the question, do you know who I am? You know, in our Christian circles, people want to, want to be treated as important folk. I am so and so. And by doing that, what, do, what are we really doing? We are robbing others. I mean, try and imagine an office, okay? An office. We see a whole row of cabins. You go to a state bank office and you uh, see a whole row of cabins. And um, each cabin has an assistant manager or in, in bigger branches, they're all managers. And then outside the cabins, there are the rows and rows of ordinary workers, clerks, temporary people, etc. Let's say one of them becomes a Christian, okay? One of these assistant managers. 
he becomes a Christian and he grows in, in Christ. And he learns about the humility of Christ who made himself nothing. And uh, he decides, and he has the guts to say to the chief manager that he no longer wants a cabin for himself because he wants to be more accessible to the people who work under him. Does it take courage to become nothing, to be approachable? The only way that God could become approachable was to become nothing. What about us? We say we want to be approachable, but we don't think it is through becoming nothing. We think it is by doing everything and gathering everything we can. Okay, let's move on quickly. Third one. Taking on the nature of a servant. Taking on the nature of a servant. Now, this is the heart of the Christmas story. Who was that child? The child was taking on the nature of a servant. Taking the very nature of a servant. God came to serve us. As the Bible itself says, he didn't come to lord it over us. The ultimate and primary purpose of Christmas, of the incarnation, is our salvation. A true servant always meets the ultimate need, not only the peripheral needs, but the root foundational needs. What does it mean to serve? Do I serve people? Can I think of people who have hurt me, let's say, in this past one year? I need to come to God and ask him for love and wisdom as to how I can really serve them. Christmas is a great time to model and speak about salvation, the salvation that is available in Jesus Christ. It's wonderful to share blankets with the poor this winter, but will we stop there? The temptation is to stop there and say, oh, let them ask me about Christ, then I will tell them. Won't we also seek to share the gospel in ways that they will understand at the right time, of course. And when we exchange gifts at Christmas, let's not forget to share the greatest gift of all, salvation in Christ. So powerlessness, he makes himself nothing. He takes on the nature of a servant. And finally, verse eight. Can anyone read verse eight? Philippians 2 verse 8. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty... Oh, sorry. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, is that Philippians 2 verse 8? No. And being in fashion as a man, he yeah. humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of cross. Death on a cross, that's right. And he became what? He became obedient. Does Jesus have to obey? Yes, he did. He became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Total obedience. Now, I know it's not very popular to preach about obedience in our times. Um, we're all living in our own spaces and you don't tell me what to do. I don't tell you what to do. The government shouldn't tell us what to do. I have my rights, etc., etc. Obedience. Jesus practiced total obedience to his father. Obedience all the way, born of a virgin, 
found in fashion as a man, born in a manger, the cross, my goodness, total, total obedience. This is the hardest part of obedience, to allow oneself to become totally helpless, vulnerable. You know, we live in a time when it is natural, natural for even little children and adults to ask, why should I do it? Even after reasons are given, we still don't do it. Even when you know what is right to do, we still don't do it. Abraham of old did not argue or ask for reasons. He obeyed totally. When he was about to bring that knife down, God stopped him. Why? Because it was God himself who was going to offer his own son as a sacrifice for the whole world. And when that happened on that cross, this time God did not stop the knife coming down. The cruelest method of death known to man. Why? How? Because, simply because, the son obeyed. The son obeyed. And Isaac is, of course, a picture of that too. Jesus obeyed totally. The principle of obedience is something you and I need to learn or relearn this Christmas. Obey God. Obey the laws of the land. Traffic lights, for example. Somebody once commented that the only Christmas decorations we have in India are the traffic lights. Just go when it's your favorite color, right? Obedience has to do with trust. Your attitude should be the same as that of Jesus Christ. And so, as we finish, are we willing to move out of our secure zone this Christmas? I don't know how many of you are familiar with the life and work of Henry Nguyen. He was born in the Netherlands. He was ordained a priest in the year 1957. For two decades, he taught in many prestigious institutions of higher learning, including Yale and Harvard. And then he left the university life and spent the last 10 years of his life in Toronto, ministering at Le Arch Daybreak, a community of mentally handicapped people. He has written over 40 books on pastoral psychology and the love of God. His best known book perhaps is titled The Wounded Healer the wounded healer. He died of a heart attack in the year 1996. His books make excellent reading material. I'd just like to finish with a few of his quotations taken from some of his books. Here is one. What makes the temptation of power so irresistible to us? Maybe it is that maybe it is that power offers an easy substitute for the hard task of love. You know, we're called to love, but it's easier to pursue power. It seems easier to be God rather than love God. It seems easier to control people than to love people. It's easier to own life than to love life. Another quotation from one of his books, Henry Nguyen. The friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing not healing, not curing. That, that is a friend who cares. 
the friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who, care, who can tolerate not knowing, not healing, not curing. That is a friend who cares. At another one, when we honestly ask ourselves, which person in our lives meant the most to us? We often find that it is those who instead of giving advice, solutions or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hands. Not those who give advice, solutions or cures, but have chosen rather to share our pain, touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand. And here's a last one from Henry Nguyen. I am deeply convinced that the Christian leader of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and to stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or her own vulnerable self. I'm deeply convinced that the Christian leader of the future is called to be completely irrelevant and to stand in this world with nothing to offer but his or her own vulnerable self. And so I finish. Are we willing to move out of our secure zones like Henry Nguyen did? I wonder if God is calling us not so much to celebrate Christmas as to serve someone, someone who is different, someone who's not like us. Are we willing to choose to become powerless, vulnerable? Are we willing to ask God for the guts to let go, change our attitude, and become more approachable? A true servant meets that ultimate need of salvation. Are we willing to really serve? And finally, how do we respond to the revealed will of God? Total obedience? Can you and I do it? this Christmas. I wish you all a truly Christ-centered Christmas. Maybe in closing, I'd like us all to observe a minute's silence as we think. Is God challenging me to do something this Christmas, to become vulnerable, to reach out to someone, someone who you've been nice and kind to, it's time to share the gospel. Maybe that's what is going to happen this Christmas. We'll observe a minute's time of uh, reflection, and then I'd like anyone in this group to volunteer to close in prayer praying for one another, that we'll all have a wonderful Christ-centered Christmas. Let's pray. Right. Can anyone close in prayer? Anyone? Please unmute and close. Let's 
let's pray i'll pray gracious loving father we praise you lord and thank you thank you lord for this time together thank you lord for what you remind us lord and thank you for every, each one who taken part to do something lord for to share your their thoughts and thank you for lord as a family together we can we all one as a family to rejoice in the, because you are our father and we belong to you and we are your children and father god we praise you lord and thank you and thank you lord for uncle tom who is spending time to remind us um christ and their centered um christmas lord and father god thank you lord we praise you and thank you thank you you send your only beloved son lord and he came and suffered and gave us a, uh, he redeemed us and he gave us salvation lord and we praise you father and thank you and also he um, given us a comforter which he is uh, with us lord and we in that uh, confidence lord we can uh, face uh, everything lord and father god we at this time we thank you lord you care do you are a um, king son uh, jesus you are uh, you are a uh, lord son still you came as a servant lord and you serve people and father god we uh, help us lord to um, please you and to do what you want us to do and to serve you father father god um help us lord to what we tasted for what the salvation we can share people lord and to bring uh, we, many people lord the joy which you given to us lord many people need to taste lord so um help us lord and also use us lord to uh, get an opportunity to bring many poor people Uh, to your kingdom and share your gospel lord and we pray for our family members those who are not yet come to your kingdom, kingdom uh, to you uh, as a child lord we uh, pray lord uh, whoever lord we pray there's so many of them lord we pray lord um, uh, uh, let your word can uh, spread this uh, uh, time of christ this lord as we give and share, share to them let them come to know you lord for your love and uh, they can come to be in your kingdom father when you come lord and so help us lord and use us and father god thank you for once again this time together and i pray for each one of them who present here and you help them lord and bless them and help them whether they are long distance whether they are lonely whether they are um, uh, whatever condition lord you know exactly but fill them with your joy lord and uh, help them to rejoice uh, with you uh, with your presence lord and to may this christmas we will be a really blessed one to be a real joy and uh, lord so uh, bless them lord and help them and thank you once again each one of them and especially uncle tom and uh, thank you once again for this time together we praise you and give you glory and honor we pray in jesus name Amen. 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 I wonder if as many as possible can you show yourself so that we can see you and maybe we can chat on happy Christmas time. <laughs> Hi everyone. How lovely. My Hello. Hi everyone. So lovely to see you. some people are hiding okay uh nadita merry christmas to you also thanks you la i am very in how wonderful thank, thank you. you thank you so much thank you welcome welcome down thank you <laughs> lovely lovely lily john priti <coughs> bye dog bye <laughs> Like uh, Marvelin, Dennis, hi, Gina, hello. That's a lovely insight. Thank you very much, Marvelin and Claudette. Yeah. Things go well. 
thank you Omicron and everything thank you <laughs> thank you yeah, thank yeah you so we will we'll be remembering all of you at christmas time and yeah. i pray you say keep safe i don't know what's the situation in india at the moment safe yeah will remain in india we are doing fine oh very <laughs> good yeah. for once <laughs> india is better than the uk anyway yeah at the moment yes sir. but india kind of um, lags behind the rest of the world typically okay at the moment i think we have uh, less than 50 positive omicron case but wow. the, that means nothing because here they don't test every sample for the genome they, they only very sporadically do that ah, like in the uk where they test every single positive yes. sample for the genome so we will never know uh, how many omicron yeah. cases we have that's a problem ignorance is bliss. <laughs> right. ignorance is bliss exactly <laughs> that's better that's better i choose grace angelina safe journey home thank you uncle thank you keep us in your prayers thanks thank you bye a very bye. blessed bye. have merry thank christmas you. to everybody bye have a good bye. family get bye. together bye. Christmas to everyone ravin and the whole family of more happy christmas dennis you are welcome bye wish you the same you, wish you wishes the same. from everybody here yeah. thank you do we meet yeah, in, okay. do we meet in the new year yes yes no no we got one more sunday to prepare for new year on boxing day all right 26 26 ah it's in stevens day yeah in stevens in stevens day <laughs> Bye bro. Bye everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.